invite you to take your Bible, please, and turn to Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6, and we'll find our text in verse number 9. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9. We're praying that the Word of God would encourage us in this hour and would motivate us to keep moving forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9. When you find it, I'd like for you to read this particular verse of Scripture with me, if you would please aloud. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, and if you have it there, would you read it together with me? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Would you mind if we read that again together? I think most of you found it now. Let's mark it in our Bibles, but let's read it together. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, fainting is not a a funny thing. Sometimes perhaps we witnessed it and thought it was a humorous thing. But in the Bible, it's not a humorous thing at all. Uh, Several years ago, I had an idea that around our home, I would obtain some animals that are called fainting goats. How many have ever heard of a fainting goat? All right. And uh, to be honest, they've hung around our house for a few years now, and I love those little guys. I think they're pretty cool. And if you've ever seen a fainting goat, in just a moment when they're startled, they have a certain blood condition where they just freeze up. In fact, sometimes they'll freeze up and just fall over on the ground. They just faint. And though it's humorous to us, I've thought many times, I'm sure that's not funny at all to the goat, right? And those watching might get a kick out of it, but to be someone who's fainting or something that's fainting is not a good thing. Maybe my personal experience with fainting has happened mostly when I've had some type of a procedure and they've caused me to pass out, right? And not too long ago that happened, and I said to the lady, I feel it. She said, I'm sticking it in your IV. I said, I feel it. I think it's happening. And the next thing I knew, I was lying in a bed with a Dr. Pepper sipping it was all over. I fainted. I was gone. I didn't know what happened. In fact, my wife was there and I said, how did I get this? How is this in my hand? She said, you ordered a Dr. Pepper. I said, well, at least I ordered the right thing when I was out. I'm glad I had that enough, enough consciousness. Fainting's a difficult thing. I remember the only occasion or one of the occasions where my wife fainted made me feel like a man because we had just been married a few years and we were traveling. In fact, we were traveling for Crown College and I was preaching and there was a group that sang and, and during a daytime, one of the folks in the church said, we want to take you to a, a marine base. And so we were in a really cool place. We were in, on, on the campus of a marine base where there were fighter jets and we actually were in a hangar of an F-16 uh, jet, and we met all the men who were maintaining that aircraft. We got to get up, go up the stairs and, and look in the cockpit. It was really pretty neat. I enjoyed it. But it was very hot out there in that hangar, and we were to the side, and my wife was expecting our first child. And I guess it was a little warm or something, and I looked at her, and I thought, uh-oh, uh-oh, she's going out. And I felt like a man that day because I actually caught her and I picked her up. And here I am, the, the young husband, carrying my wife through the marine hangar, okay? I just, <laughs> I just felt really strong. And, uh, of course, she came to and she was fine and they got her water to drink and all was well in the end, which I'm thankful for. But I felt pretty, uh, pretty tough. I felt like the big guy that day when she fainted and I caught her. Well, the Bible obviously has a lot to say about fainting. But it's all, of course, not just something in the physical realm because so many of us are tempted to faint spiritually. We're in our walk for the Lord. And to faint is not a funny thing. To faint is not something that God desires for us. In fact, God is admonishing us here that there are promises about the reaping that will come. There are promises about how God will come through, but then he says, if we faint not. Now, I love the promises of God, and there are so many of them, thousands of them in the Bible. In due season, he says, we shall reap. But many of the promises of God we cannot fully experience unless we're willing to do something that God has asked us to do. 
God says here, we will reap if we faint not. To faint in this particular sense in the Bible means to become so wearied that we lose heart, that we lose the spirit to keep pressing on. It means that we lose the courage that is required to keep going one foot in front of the other in the Christian life. And we all recognize that that possibility is there. In fact, that tendency is even there because the Lord Jesus himself said to his disciples, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And by the way, the flesh is still weak. The flesh is always weak. The flesh will always and forever be weak. And so there's something inside of us that says, it's not worth it. You've worked hard enough. You've tried long enough. You've done enough. You've said enough. You've got you to stop sometime. Just give up. Just faint. Something on the inside of the old man that says, it's time to quit. But God is saying to us, there's, there's so many of my promises yet for you to claim and for you to experience if you'll just keep moving forward. You know, the Lord Jesus back in Matthew chapter 9, would you turn there for just a moment? The Lord Jesus noticed those who were fainting, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 9, we come to this familiar passage in verse 36. The Bible says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. And were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Can we acknowledge that the world around us without Christ is a world that's fainting and without a shepherd? And the Lord Jesus knows that. And those who have quit, those who have given up in life need the Lord Jesus Christ, they need a Savior to lead them and guide them and to motivate them and to give them purpose for living. That's why we need to go into the harvest field. But it's just very simply, the truth is very simply this. If the world is fainting, how can we help them if we're fainting? You see, how are we going to help a world that needs a shepherd and needs a Savior and needs purpose in life and needs a reason to live the next day. How are we going to help that lost and dying world if we ourselves as believers are fainting? We have nothing to give them. We have nothing to help them with. If we've quit, if we've thrown in the towel. You know, it's sad, but fainting Christians are all around. It's like the highway of life is riddled by the wayside with Christians who've just stopped. They've lost their courage. They've lost their heart. They've lost their spirit go forward. Maybe they got disillusioned. Maybe they got disappointed somewhere. Maybe things didn't turn out like they thought it should turn out. Maybe they felt like God was a million miles away or they felt like their efforts were in vain and they weren't seeing the fruit of their labor like they really should. And and the highway of life now is riddled with Christian after Christian after Christian who's just stalled by the wayside like a car that's pulled off the interstate and out of gas and they just stalled and they're stopped and they're somewhere but they're not moving forward for God you know that's why in the book of Galatians when God speaks of this about not being weary and well-doing in the same chapter he talks about the fact that we need to bear one another's burdens In other words, as believers, we're going to see other believers faint and we need to be the first ones to run to their side and say, I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I want to get you back on the road. I want to get you to be filled with courage and heart and spirit again so that you can get back in the battle for the Lord Jesus. And this church that we're all privileged to be a part of, we ought to be a church family that's always encouraging one another not to faint. Stay in the battle. Stay in the work. Let's keep pressing on. Let's not lose heart. You know, first mentions in the Bible are always very important. When God mentions something the first time, it usually sets a precedent or gives us some, some foundation stones for understanding Uh, about that truth for the rest of the Bible. I want you to go back with me, please, for just a moment and look at the first mention of fainting in the Bible. It's a a 
prime example of the dangers of fainting. Look with me in Genesis chapter 25. Would you turn there? And we'll go right to a brief account of, in the life of Esau and Jacob. And perhaps you remember in the Old Testament that Esau and Jacob were sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And they had a most interesting relationship. It was very adversarial. But it was so because of this account. And the Bible says there in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 29, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field. And notice that the Bible says, and he was faint. First man in all the scripture who was faint. Notice verse 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Here we have the first feigning man in all the Bible. And would you notice this feigning man had many different susceptibilities to problems? We have to watch ourselves when we feel like we're feigning because that makes us get into an arena, if you please, where the devil really likes to put a target on us. This feigning man was prone to deception. Jacob sees that he's weak and he's wearied and he's, he's lost heart and he's lost spirit. And Jacob says, oh, this is a prime time to get an advantage in his life. And if we don't watch out, our feigning moments will be the times that the devil tries to get in. He tries to deceive us. He's going to try to steal away from us something that, that could be honoring to God. Steal away perhaps our testimony. He was prone to deception. In fact, he got so discouraged that he began to exaggerate and said in verse 32, I am at the point to die. You know, that's what happens to all of us when we get a little weary. We start exaggerating, really, the magnitude of what's going on. And we start thinking, it's all over. There's no way forward. There's no new start for me. There's no way I could ever do this again. He says, I'm at the point to die. I don't think so. But his faint-heartedness made him think that. And then notice in verse 33, he makes a very foolish decision. The Bible says he swear unto him. He said, you can have my birthright. What a pitiful exchange. All of the blessing of his father in exchange for a bowl of beans, a bowl of lentils. All of the blessing and riches of Isaac that had come even from Abraham. And he made this poor decision, this foolish decision to swap it all for a bowl of beans. Can you imagine? See, God is warning us from the very beginning of the scriptures that we're in a dangerous position if we get faint and we stay faint and we stay weary. We've got to get back on track. We've got to start moving forward again very quickly because if not, we're going to make some poor decisions. We're going to have some poor judgment we're going to start getting down and discouraged and exaggerating really what's going on in life. And we're going to be deceived by a deceiver who comes our way. And isn't it just like the devil to come in that wrong moment, in that faint moment? Go back with me, if you would, please, in your Bibles. And go back to Galatians chapter number 6. Would you look at it again? The Bible says in verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Are you fainting? Somebody sitting next to you tonight fainting? Somebody in your family fainting tonight? Somebody in this church family around you, are they fainting tonight? You see, we need to be the first ones to come alongside each other and say, we don't have time to faint. We don't need to stay in this weariness. We've got to get moving forward because we don't want the devil to get an advantage. We don't want to make some foolish decisions that we're going to regret down the road. We've got a life to live for the Lord. We've got a work to do for Christ. There's a world outside these walls that is fainting and they need a shepherd and they need the gospel. How can we help them if we're fainting? We've got to encourage one another and we've got to say, by God's grace, we're going to discover the secret to not fainting. 
Now, there are just a handful of times in the New Testament that God speaks very specifically about not fainting in this way. And I would like to show you those couple of uses in the New Testament, and then we'll come back to our text in a moment. Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 18 for just a moment? And let me give you this admonition from God's Word. Uh, first of all, do not faint in your praying. Do not faint in your praying. God says to us in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now what is the parable the Lord Jesus gave? Look at it in verse 2, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Notice the story that's given. Christ is saying to his disciples in a nutshell, just like the woman kept on coming, and she kept on coming, and she kept on asking, and she kept on in importunity appealing for the judge to avenge her. He's saying here, I don't want you to faint in your praying. I want you to keep coming to me day and night, day and night. God will hear. God will answer. I believe this is still in the Bible, in the book of James chapter 5. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We heard earlier this day, what about when God says no? Well, God may say no, but he doesn't say stop praying. And I found this, that when prayer seems not to be working, I heard the other day about a very a, a once famous man who was the head of CNN and TBS and many cable news networks. His name was Ted Turner. And when he was a child, he was brought up in church and his sister got ill and uh, they prayed for her not to die, but she died. And he said, when God didn't answer my prayer, I realized there is no God. I will not believe in God. And that's why he said he became a humanist and an atheist because of unanswered prayer. Well, God never told us to stop praying. God may be refining our prayer. God may be bringing us to the place of changing our prayer. In fact, God may be more up to the, the place of changing us. But God never tells us to stop praying. Keep on praying until the light breaks through. Keep on praying. He'll answer you. Listen, God is still on the throne. And when the Lord Jesus said, shall he find faith on the earth? Maybe he means it in context very simply this. When the Lord comes again, is he still going to find his children just believing him and praying and seeking his face? Listen, it may be long and it may seem weary and it may seem like something that you're not sure if God's going to answer or not. But do not faint in your praying. The Lord Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Did you notice the second time the Lord uses this word? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. And let me say this from God's word tonight. Do not faint in your ministering to others. Do not faint in your ministering to others. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Did you notice that? We've received a ministry. And therefore, we're not going to faint. What is that ministry? Look at the next verse. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. 
and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. You know what Paul's saying here? He's saying, look, we have a ministry. It's not just Paul's ministry. It's all of our ministry. It's the ministry of preaching Christ. It's the ministry of the gospel. It's the ministry, as he says in verse 2, of handling the word of God and taking the word of God and the gospel message to others. And he says here, because we've received this ministry, we faint not. We're not going to give up. Because if we hide our gospel, it's going to be hidden to the lost. And we're not going to see people saved who need to believe the gospel and be saved. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. I read not long ago of a, a man who's a very famous apologist in recent years. His name is Norman Geisler. And I read that a Sunday school worker came to his door and met him and said, would you like to come to Bible school when he was just a boy? And he said, yes, I'll go to Bible school with some other children that he knew. And he attended the Bible school and they came back and said, would you like to come to our church on the Lord's Day? We have a bus, we'll pick you up. And he said, yes, I'll come. And they came for a Sunday and they came for another Sunday and another and another and another and they said that they came for 400 Sundays in a row and picked up Mr. Geisler and took him to church. And still yet, he'd never come to Christ. And when he was a senior in high school, after someone had come to his door and fired up a Sunday school bus and came by his neighborhood and brought him to church for the 400th time, he professed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, aren't you glad they didn't stop at 399, right? Listen, God says we have a ministry. We have a gospel. We have the word of God. There was an older preacher in Scotland that I've read about who's an unnamed man. In fact, no one would know his name if I called it. And he preached in a little church in Scotland for many, many years. And frankly, he had a very declining ministry. A candle was going out seemingly. He was faithful. He was giving the word of God. He was preaching the gospel. And finally, after he'd been there for many, many years, a deacon came up, and in a very crude and unkind way, he said to the man, he said, Pastor, I believe God's hand is off you. You've only had one convert this entire year. And at that, just a little bitty boy, maybe you should pray about what God would have you to do. And in a crude way, the man stomped off and it left the pastor standing there with tears in his eyes. He felt it like a failure. He felt, well, maybe God is finished. Maybe God is through. I've tried to be faithful. I'm trying to give the word. But I have only had one convert this year. And at that very moment, as he, as he had tears in his eyes, his coat tugged and it was the little boy who was his convert that year. His name was Robert. And the little boy said, uh, Pastor, I came to find you after church today because I believe that God is speaking to me about being a preacher. And the man said, well, little Robert, I believe that God could make you a preacher. And the boy said, if I go to school and get an education, do you believe I could preach like you preach? And he said, yes, Robert, when you grow up one day, you go to school and you prepare, you'll preach like I preach. God will help you. And the little boy trotted off, and it was many, many, many years later that that same little boy came from Africa back to London, and every one in London wanted to meet him. Every noble in the city wanted to have him over to his house because that little boy was the very famous Robert Moffat, the missionary who had shaken Africa for Christ. Aren't you glad the old preacher just kept on ministering and kept on giving the gospel? He's clipped a lot of coupons in heaven, I'll tell you that, right? Listen, the Lord says to us, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Don't let go. Don't quit. Don't pull over to the side of the road. Don't stop. Don't lose heart. Don't lose spirit. Don't lose courage. We may not see the, the fruit now. It may not be due season at the moment in whatever area you're ministering in, but don't faint. Don't give up because we got a ministry to fulfill. That's the second time it's used in the New Testament. Would you look again at the third time that we find it? It's still in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look again, if you would, in verse number 8. The apostle writes, he says, We are troubled on every side. Oh, there's trouble, yet not distressed. 
We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, we're persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. What's the apostle saying? He's saying, look, there's a lot of trouble here. There's a lot of trials and persecution. There's a lot of distress here. But there's another side to it. Look again down in verse number 15. He says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Verse 16, For which cause we faint not. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What's happening? God is saying to us in this admonition, do not faint in your troubles. Do not faint in your praying and do not faint in your ministering, but do not faint in your troubles. There's coming the trials. There's coming the persecution, he's saying. There's coming the distress. But Paul says, but all this can redound to the glory of God. And because of that, we're not going to faint. Spurgeon said, many men owe the grandeur of their lives to their tremendous difficulties. In other words, they would never have the kind of life that's brought this glory to God if it weren't for the trouble, if it weren't for the trials, if it weren't for the difficulty. Someone said and wrote the poem, my life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors, he worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget. He sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle ceases to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reasons why. I don't know why we have to deal with sorrow, but I know this. Our sorrow, our trouble, our difficulty is not a possibility. It's a guarantee. It's going to happen. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The trouble's coming. The trials are coming. They're coming again. If you've already had them, they're going to come to the doorstep another time, and they're going to come again and again until we get delivered from this world and we're with Jesus. The question is not, is trouble there? The question is, are we going to faint in the trouble? Are we going to faint in the trial? Are we going to faint in the difficulty? That's the question. And God says, be not weary in well-doing. In due season, we're going to reap, but only if we faint not. Don't faint in your praying. Don't faint in your ministry. Don't faint in the midst of your trouble because God has something for you on the other side of that trouble that you're never going to reap if you quit. You're never going to reap if you lose heart. And then notice back in our text, turn to Galatians with me real quick again, chapter number 6. God says, do not faint in doing right. Do not faint in doing right. Look at verse number 7 in Galatians chapter 6. He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I'm going to pause there for just a moment. I think I misunderstood the tone of that verse for many years. I thought it was a threat. I thought it was meant to make me shake in my boots. Watch out. If you're sowing something really bad, you're going to reap it really bad. And by the way, that is true. We all reap what we sow, and we reap more than we sow. There's no doubt about that. But I thought it was more of a threatening verse until I read it in context. Look at the very next verse. The context of this chapter is there's the flesh and the spirit. And he's saying, now look, if you'll walk in the spirit, you're going to reap some really great things in life. Look at verse number 8. He says, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting saying here there's a lot of great things to reap i've got some great promises for you but notice verse 9 and let us not be weary in well-doing the admonition here is about our doing good our doing right he says look stay on the right track keep doing right 
Do right till the stars fall. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says the same thing. Be not weary in well-doing. Others around us may be fainting. In fact, it's a discouraging thing, isn't it? Maybe the most discouraging thing for a Christian when you see another believer who says, I'm tired of just doing right. I'm tired of holding the line. I'm tired of walking around by the book. I'm tired. I'm going with the world. I'm going to follow the the, the flow of the culture. I'm just going to flow with everybody else. Is Is there not a more discouraging thing than that? When another believer who claims to be a believer at least says, I'm going that way. I'm tired of holding the line. Listen, all others may may give up, but God says, do not be weary in your well-doing. Keep doing right. Stay true to the Lord. Keep your commitment to your Savior. A little boy on one occasion whose mother and father were getting on to him, and they said, why are we having such a hard time with you? He's just a little guy. We've had to spank you three or four times today. And the little boy said, I'm just so tired of doing what's right. You know, that may be true of little boy, and sometimes that may be true of big boys like us, where we just think, I'm just tired of doing right. And God says, no, I want to motivate you. I want to encourage you. Don't lose heart. Don't lose your spirit. Don't lose your courage. Just stay on the right track for the Lord. Just do right till the stars fall, right? Don't be weary in the well-doing. And somebody might say, if I'm not going to faint in in doing right, and I'm not going to faint in trials, and I'm not going to faint in prayer, and I'm not going to faint in my ministry to other people, how am I going to do it? Am I just going to muster this up? Absolutely not. Can I tell you, the 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 only potential we have in our weak selves is just to faint at all that. How are we going to do it? What's the great secret? I'm so glad the Bible's in front of me. I'm so glad I got answers to those type things. In fact, God gives us the simplest of answers and yet the most profound. Would you like to know? Look in Hebrews chapter 12 and I'll show you. How do we do it? How do I encourage you not to faint? How do you encourage me not to faint when I want to quit and give up? How do we do it? I had a coach, a good man when I was growing up. He was my coach in all the sports. And he's a good man. He loved the Lord. He loved his family. He loved kids and he loves sports. I guess that makes a good coach if you got all that together, right? But I remember my coach many times when we were running hard, he'd say, come on, you got more in you. Come on, you can find it. Come on, let's keep going. And he'd just encourage us, just find a little more something in you. And you know, that may be true physically, but I'm going to tell you, we get to the point spiritually where there's just nothing left, where there's nothing, there's no more strength. We don't know where we're going to find it because tank is on zero. We got nothing left. How are we not going to faint? The Lord tells us the secret here. Would you look at Hebrews 12? Look at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and what? And faint in your mind. What is the answer to fainting? There's only one answer. We've got to get our eyes on Jesus. We've got to consider him. And by the way, when we look at him, we realize he never fainted. He never stopped. He never lost courage. He never lost spirit. He never lost heart. He went all the way to Calvary. He bled and died. He was buried. He rose again. He is set down now at the right hand of the Father. Aren't you thankful he never fainted? And the one who never fainted is the only one who can enable us not to faint. Hey, we got to get our eyes on him. Do you know somebody about to faint tonight? Do you know a friend, a family member? Do you know a fellow Christian maybe even here? And you think, well, they're going through it. I can see him sputtering. I can see him faltering. I can see him about to quit. 
You know what we need to do? We need to come to their side in love and kindness and we need to bear that burden, but we need to say one thing. Hey, get your eyes on Jesus. We need to point them to the Lord. He's the answer. He's the source of strength. He's exactly what they need. Look at the Lord. Look unto Jesus. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Hey, it may not be somebody else fainting. Maybe it's you tonight. And you think, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I can go the next day. I don't know if I can keep doing what God has given me to do. I don't know if I can keep on praying. I don't know if I can keep up the good fight. Friend, can I just tell you, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. No Christian has ever quit with his eyes on Jesus. It's never happened and it never shall. And the solution for all of us is one thing. We've got to turn our eyes back upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth, whatever those circumstances are, they grow strangely dim, don't they? In the light of his glory and his grace. Would you bow your heads with me tonight, please?